Thank you for inviting me. So I've, I'm going to talk a bit about what we've been doing around sort of the use of diaries and monitoring um, in mental health conditions, particularly bipolar disorder, because that's the area in which I work. Um, and we've been doing this for seven or eight years, so we've got a lot of data and we've got to know a bit about how people use monitoring and diaries and interact with them in terms of their own self-management. Um, but we're also going to talk a little bit about whether actually monitoring is an intervention in itself, so touching on some of the things that uh, were talked about this morning, and equally whether you combine that with an educational intervention, actually whether that has more of an impact or not. Um, and then I'm going to move on towards the end of the talk just to talk a little bit around low friction data capture, so thinking about that idea that in fact, it's quite onerous to, complete, to have to continuously complete questionnaires. And are there other things we can learn about individuals that may give us the same information without having to ask them repeatedly? That's not to say that you would replace questionnaires, but it might mean you targeted your questionnaires in a slightly more nuanced way. So why do we sort of get interested in um, mood monitoring? Well, we've done it for a long time, but it's usually been on pen and paper, and that's kind of quite hard. And the big change, I suppose, in the last 10 years has been smartphone ownership. Um, so this is just showing you the change just over um, the period between 2012 and 2015. And as you can see, it has increased in all groups. But I would just highlight that actually there is quite an age difference in this. So if you're looking at people over the age of about 55, you don't see anywhere near the levels of smartphone ownership. And I guess f for us in mental health, that has quite big issues in terms of being inclusive, but also if you're thinking about using these approaches in dementia, for example, clearly it's not going to be as helpful as in younger populations. But most of my work is focused on younger populations, so that's quite useful for me. And actually, if you own a mobile phone, you're quite likely to have downloaded some form of health app. Okay, so about 60% of people have done that. Um, this just gives you some of those sorts of metrics. So we know that people are already using this to enhance their health, understand their health, monitor it. Um, but actually one of the challenges is very few of these apps have ever been tested. Okay, so if you actually look at most health apps, they've never been used in a clinical trial. If you look at the content of them against what we would view to be standard criteria, they don't fit either. So there's a real question for us, I think in health more generally, about the fact that people are using these things, but if we don't really know what they're measuring, they've never been validated in terms of the sort of outcome measures they generate. So it's just to kind of put that out there. And similarly, the wearables, the Fitbits, those Garmin devices, all of that sort of stuff, they won't give you their algorithms, they won't give you the raw data, you don't really know what they're measuring. And maybe that doesn't matter if you're interested in an individual, but if you want to compare people, that becomes quite problematic. And of course, big tech companies have got into health uh, in a big way, and so we've got lots of other devices available to us. You can wear a device, you can measure your heart rate with your phone, you can use your device as an intervention, of course. Um, and this is an, uh, an example of Sleepio, which is an app that intervenes for sleep. So you can actually combine your diary monitoring and your intervention and have sort of closed that loop a bit. And I'm going to show you just an example of where that's been used um, already in mental health. So mood is what we've tended to focus on, lots of different ways to think about mood. Some people like it visually, some people like lots of questions. Bottom line is we've been doing it a lot um, and it's been done a lot in lots of places internationally. I'm just going to share with you some of the experience we've had of using these diary approaches in, um, as, as outcome measures in, in interventions. So I think I've probably mentioned this already, one of our difficulties is the retrospective bias inherent in mood. So we could probably all say how we feel now, I think that would be reasonable, probably a bit full of lunch, slightly tired, just enjoyed the sun, there was a quite a cute cat, that might have cheered us up a bit. Um, we might be able to remember how we felt this morning, a bit anxious, not sure what I was coming to, haven't really done much in education before, that would be my sort of mood recall. How did I feel yesterday? I can't actually probably immediately recall what I was doing yesterday and I, that would, you know, so I can't really think about yesterday very well and how I think about yesterday is totally influenced by today. So of course when we think about mood that's one of our big challenges and for me as a clinician I'm asking someone how they felt over the last month. Well they're not, I mean poor things I can't tell them how I felt over the last month so it's unlikely that a patient is going to remember. So actually, being able to get people to measure these things prospectively is really, really very helpful. So it's a much more accurate picture of what's going on. Um, so it also allows it to collect us over much longer periods of time than we've been able to do with the traditional pen and pencil uh, measures. And we get more data because people lose bits of paper, don't they? And then it gets confused and they haven't got a pen with them, all the rest of it. Whereas this, you can ping someone quite quickly, you can remind them, you can get the data within a few minutes out of the way, done, don't have to think about it again for that day. So this is the system we've been using, it's called True Colours. 
Um, it's, it was designed as a self-management system. People get sent a reminder, they fill in their prompt, and um, that's all they have to do. Very simple. So you, most people get two questionnaires, but you can add personalised questions. In this example, because I'm going to talk about bipolar patients mostly, we ask them about depression and mania. Then their scores get logged on a graph and they can look at them. Okay. And actually, this just gives you that in a bit more detail. So red is mania, blue is depression. And then we've, we've also shown the individual items. So you can see changes just by the how, how much the sort of bubbles expand and retract as to where the change is happening. So we're not just looking at total scores. You can actually uh, look at individual change. So for us as clinicians, that's actually really handy because I can sit with someone in clinic and say, well, you know, what was going on here? You clearly got a lot sadder, for example, and really try and understand that in the context of what was going on for them rather than just taking a total score, which might sort of mislead me somewhat. So let's say they'd been bereaved at that point. That's, that would probably be an entirely understandable response, wouldn't it? Whereas if I'd looked at that total score and said they're depressed, I could have had a, a very different um, interpretation. They can annotate this as well. They can put notes on exactly what's happened, they can put their meds, those sorts of things. So it allows us to track things visually um, in a very neat way. And what that's done, it's allowed us to do lots of fancy maths, which I'm not going to talk about because I'm not a mathematician, um, in terms of understanding mood disorder. Okay? So traditionally, we've thought of bipolar disorder in this way, having periods of depression, periods of mania, all very neat and packaged, and periods of wellness. That ain't the reality at all. It is far more variable, okay? It's actually people bounce around all over the place. And it's, m it's likely that mood instability is, is much more problematic than this stuff. Very few people fit this pattern. And it's not really surprising, is it? Because most of us vary a bit, okay? But actually, in, in bipolar disorder, their mood variability is much, much higher. And it's that that's associated with poorer outcomes, with poorer treatment response. If, you have, if you're very unstable in mood, as a teenager, for example, you're at higher risk of getting bipolar disorder. So just by monitoring people over a long period of time, we've been able to understand the disorder and challenge our preconceptions about the diagnosis. It's been really interesting in that respect. Now, of course, this is just showing you some of the sorts of data we can collect. Here I'm showing you some comparisons between weekly and daily ratings, and I think there was a bit of... It was raised a bit this morning on how often do you ask, because that's actually quite important, isn't it, the frequency of inquiry. And so we thought we'd actually explore this. So what I'm showing you here is people who've completed those weekly ratings. So there's bipolar. We'd have another group called uh, people with borderline personality disorder and a healthy group, okay? So this is weekly ratings, and I hope what's obvious is our two clinical groups um, have, are, have more symptoms, okay? That's not a surprise, is it? They're, they're clinical groups than our healthy groups. And even if you do that on a daily basis, you've still got a bit of a difference, but it's not so striking because actually our healthy people have daily change as well. Um, and if we look at instability, because that's what we're really interested in, we start to see these are medians. They are quite statistically significantly different, although the graph doesn't show it very well. But actually, people with bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder are far more um, unstable than our healthy groups. Here's a much better example. So you can see that really neatly, OK? Because we didn't know what healthy people were like. We just assumed they didn't have mood instability. No one had ever measured that before. Um, so we can do quite a lot with just even understanding how we can distinguish diagnoses, just with very simple, these are not difficult kind of things to ask people, it takes them a few minutes to complete. And clearly we can then say, well, it, we can identify new treatment targets. So we've completed these diaries over, we've probably got seven or eight years of data on some of these guys now. Um, and you can then say, well, it, should we be thinking about how our treatments work in a different way and using the self-report measures to um, analyze that. So that's exactly um, what we've done. So this is, um, don't worry about the detail of this, but these are, this is a randomized controlled trial, so I'm afraid it falls into all of the problems that were talked about in the lecture before lunch. Insofar as we've taken a group, we've tried to make look as similar as possible um, and compared their outcome, their, some of them pre and post a treatment. But this is, I think, the first RCT in this area that's been done entirely on self-report data, okay? It isn't me as a clinician telling, saying, oh, this patient's well, this patient's ill. This is actually the patient reporting it. And I think that's kind of important. And what we find is actually on self-report, our treatment group, um, which is our red line here, okay, did better than our people on placebo. So that's just self-report. That is the patient's experience, not me, not me giving them computer games to play or being very objective or anything. In the end, it's what the patient experiences that's important. 
So actually on self-report, we can kind of, we can pick up signals. And I think that's, there's always been in, certainly in medicine, a bit of a worry about self-report. Is it reliable? They might just lie. They might just say what they think you want to hear, that sort of thing. But this was following people up after over 12 months. Um, so it's unlikely that their desire to please us would last that long. So um, we still find that actually we've got statistically significant differences. So kind of useful and a really different way of thinking about designing clinical trials where you go with the patient self-report as your primary outcome, not something that's determined by a professional. I'm just going to move on to talk about another trial where we've done this, which might be, I guess, more relevant in this context, which is why I thought I'd include it, which is about education and online tracking, okay? So this is a specific study for bipolar disorder. In fact, it's just been accepted for publication. And this was comparing two things. So FIM, which was a facilitated... Um, uh, integrated management, so where people did five sessions where they were psychoeducational with a facilitator who sat with them, thought about the particular topics with them in the context of their disorder, versus people who were just given the manual to read. Okay, so it was really testing whether actually having someone help you think about your disorder and learn about it uh, made much of a difference. <coughs> so they used the mood monitoring, as I've shown you. They had just five 50-minute sessions. These were manualised, so in theory they were delivered in very similar ways. We recorded the, 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 those sessions and then had um, raters rate the reliability between different facilitators, so we're pretty certain that they were, uh, they were reliably and consistently um, delivered. And these are the sorts of standard things you would do in psychoeducation, so identifying someone's individual relapse signature, thinking about their risk factors, daily rhythm, meds, alcohol, and then finalising a sort of mood management plan that they would agree. And what was interesting, we found absolutely no difference uh, at all. Okay, so in quite in contrast to what you were talking about earlier, we didn't find any difference between them. If you give them a manual to read versus sitting with these people, it made no difference in terms of their relapse or readmission, so our kind of classic clinical indicators. But what it did do is this, <coughs> which is in terms of changes in people's knowledge, we saw it really quite a significant increase in the people who had facilitators. So this is um, it's a questionnaire basically about your knowledge of your disorder. Okay. So much as it didn't change your relapse and readmission rates, perhaps that's not a surprise. It's a hugely biological illness. I, I kind of, in some sense, that's intuitive to me. The fact that someone sat with you and helped you understand your disorder does seem to actually have increased people's awareness and understanding themselves in terms of the outcome on, on this measure, at least. That was in combination with the diary monitoring, which formed part of their facilitated sessions. So similar, but sort of different outcomes to what we were um, discussing earlier. If you just, so they've done this with smartphones. This is some uh, work that was published last year, where they had an intervention smartphone that pinged up something, kind of said, do this, do that. A CPN will call you, whatever it was, in response to people's mood, versus a control where you just recorded your mood and did nothing. And what this shows you is there was absolutely no difference. All those confidence intervals massively overlap um, across time. So each time that they were assessed, each time point, it made no difference at all. So again, sort of challenging this idea a bit about intervening with diaries in this particular context. But I think there's a question about whether actually the monitoring in itself is the intervention. And certainly from my perspective, I think that's probably what it is. So it's the, it's the being asked, being prodded, thinking about it that seems to be much more helpful. So I've just done a big study for um, about the last three years where we've taken these same three groups of people I showed you earlier. They were given a smartphone. They did their daily and weekly monitoring, which I've, I've shown you. And they wore lots of gadgets. I'm going to show you some data from that in a minute. But a lot of that group, we had some weekly monitoring on already. So we can look at their pre-intervention versus much more high intensity. And this gives you a lovely example of, of what happens. So this is their depression score. This is the point they enter our study. Okay. And I hope I don't have to convince you particularly that even visualising this, that person seems to have had quite significant improvements in their symptoms. Just, we haven't done any medication, okay? none of that. We've just given them daily ratings. So they get a... a, a, a thing ping up on their phone gets them to rate it. This is the only study I have ever done where some participants had more than 100% compliance with the, the study kind of expectations because they found going into the app and just doing this clarified, well they said, clarified how they felt 
and it enabled them to manage the situation better because it just sort of said, actually, I am angry or I am feeling sad or this is what's going on for me. It wasn't something we expected at all. It wasn't kind of how the study was set up. Um, and if you test this significantly both at an individual level, so taking within individual comparisons, so comparing that bit with that bit, or we take the groups as a whole, pre and post, across all three groups, including the healthy people, which I think is an important point to stress, that just doing daily monitoring appears to improve your overall sense of, of where you're at. And what's more, it seems to be maintained, and I think that's another question, isn't it? The novelty of something, you'd think, fine, first couple of months, that's great, then you get bored of doing it. 120 out of our 130 participants opted to stay in the study to a year. They only had to do the first three months, that's all we paid them for. They got given a rather out-of-date Android smartphone. There was no incentive to keep doing this, other than the fact that actually people found it helpful. So I think there's a, there's a really interesting question about actually just the doing of something being an intervention in itself. And certainly in the context I'm working in, maybe enough, in fact. <coughs> and I wanted to put this in, I appreciate this is probably little specific to my kind of area of work, but I think with all this development of tech and diaries and longitudinal monitoring, people have to use it. And it has to, you know, that actually the experience of the person using monitoring is really important. Otherwise, you might as well forget it. Um, so the first thing to say is this is the overall compliance. So some people had more than 100%, some less. But just to show that this in psychiatric samples is extraordinary to get sort of 80% of measures completed is, is you don't usually get anywhere near that. And that's both for our weekly and, and daily ratings. And look, there's no difference between the groups. I thought the healthy people get bored of rating their mood because they don't have the variation in symptoms that the other two groups have. And in some senses, you'd say, well, what incentive have they got to keep doing it? But they did. Um, so I think that's the first thing to say. Bear in mind, they got no feedback from this. They weren't getting sort of things sent to them saying, we've noticed this pattern or that pattern. They were, it was just simply the act of doing it. We then interviewed our participants. We felt that was quite important to actually get individual um, narratives around what it was that they thought had been useful. And a lot of um, the comments were around insight and gaining understanding. And again, it wasn't limited simply to the clinical groups. This was true in our healthy control groups as well. So you, you got sort of qu quotes like this. It's generally made me more of aware of how I've been feeling, like the different fluctuations in my mood and the stuff like that, which might have lessened some of the extremes I couldn't have faced. Or I really just, just raised self-awareness of my moods, how I manage them and how I sleep. <coughs> there was also something, we got them to do it very intensively for one week. And people say something about just knowing in the moment how I feel, recognising that being different from the long term, so that sense of how mood changes moment to moment versus your sort of the weather versus the climate is often the expression that's um, used. Um, and I guess the next question as well, it's all very well, knowing about your mood, do you do anything about it? Um, and actually a number of people talked about the fact that this insight had led some, to some behavioural change, so by noticing the pattern they had actually then done something about it. And um, uh, kind of interesting for me, I suppose, as a clinician, was the sense that because they'd generated the data, yeah, actually, you know, I did, I got, I got pissed on Friday night, I was feeling really irritable the following day, and I know my doctors always said that, but I never really believed them until now. So there's something very powerful about the, the, the data being generated by the individual, not somebody telling them that that was the case. So actually experiencing it in real time seemed to be much more powerful than us saying, well, you need to look after your sleep, you need to take your medication, all the sorts of things that might be seem quite boring and kind of standard practice. Much more powerful if the patient notices it themselves. And some people just said it validated. Them. It was validating. Just doing this gave them a sense of actually, I'm not making it up. It isn't just in my head. This is, you know, I, I, I can really understand it in a bit better. And it's a nice to know that there's something that's measurable that gives me a sense of, of it all. <coughs> but, as I'm sure anyone who's done these sorts of studies uh, involving sort of long-term diary keeping knows people these sorts of things only work if people will do them the data is only useful if you can actually get it in the first place and in our kind of field is that obviously participant com compliance with with study measures often depends on how ill they are or indeed how well they are because if they're too <coughs> ill they don't want to do it if they're too well what's the point I'm well doctor and it can be quite irritating having to keep repeatedly answering the same questions Whatever it is, you know, I think I'm sure we've all had that experience when we're asked for feedback on products on Amazon or whatever. You just say, oh, shut up, I don't want to be doing with it. So, um, you know, there's all those factors that come into, into compliance. And of course, we're relying on self-report. You might argue that's great. There are 
those that would argue that's not so good, not so useful, it's got inherent bias within it. And of course you've got to know what questions to ask, and I think that's a real challenge, knowing what the questions are to ask actually, um, getting it right, getting what's sensitive for that individual, and you know, each individual will be very different. So on our system we do allow people to personalise their questions on top of the um, kind of more standard things we ask. But I think when, when you're d anything becomes sort of more digitised, of course, you're, the limits, you're much more limited, aren't you, to close questions, yes, no, things with simple answers. Um, and I think that can sometimes be challenging. So we've had an interest in, are there other, what we would call low friction or passive data measures that might be of interest? I'm going to just share with you one um, data stream that has been surprisingly informative. I have to say, we didn't expect it to be. Um, before I do that, just to say, of course, your device collects more than just your mood or your emails. It does all of this. This is all the sorts of data that you can pick up from people, okay, um, pretty passively. Um, so you can look at their phone activity. People have done that in bipolar disorder. You can look at their location. That's what I'm going to talk about. You can look at how they use their device. So there's that study in the States that's looked at mobile phone devices um, in educational settings, and we know you can pretty much predict who does well at college or not versus how many times they check their mobile phone through the night. That won't come as a surprise, but actually, th you know, that's just picking up not what they're doing, just simply the fact that the phone light's switched on and they've interacted with the, the phone. Kind of interesting. So there are other metadata you can pick up. So I'm going to talk about geolocation. We did not capture where people were. Let's say that to begin with. It was from a random point. So I don't know, do not know at any point where somebody was, but I can pretty much infer when they're at home because most of us go home at night. So you get a data stream that looks like this. Okay. So this is just for some one person for a week. This person clearly is pretty regular. They go to work about the same time. They stay in the place of work most of the day. They come home. On Tuesday, they might have popped into the pub on their way home. <laughs> but broadly speaking, they do the same thing. And then on Sundays, they do absolutely nothing. <laughs> kind of standards, you know, we would think probably most, you know, if everyone's got a nine to five job, that most of us will look a bit like that. And then, of course, you can identify bits. So you can look at how long they spend traveling, the number of different places they go to, the time they spend traveling, those sorts of things. So we don't know where they are, but we can pull off those um, metrics. These are the sorts of things, I'm not going to go into this in detail, you can look at, but you can look at where they go, how much time they spend there, how many different places. You can compare days, so you get a sense of regularity over the week. Um, okay. And what we can do is then look at these. So what I'm showing here is just how two of these things, so entropy and homestay, relate to your mood. Okay, and let's focus on homestay, because I think this is the most intuitive, all right, which is the more depressed you get, the more time you spend at home. Well, there's a surprise, but it's kind of neat you pick that up in the geolocation data. Of course, we, can't impl we don't know what causality is. It might be that you're stuck at home, so you're bored and you feel more miserable. Equally, because you're depressed, you may spend more time at home. But kind of interesting, you can pick that up in this kind of messy geolocation data. But what's really much more interesting is this, which is that those patterns with depression can be found across all these metrics. So what I'm showing you here in blue, healthy, in red, bipolar, well, in yellow, bipolar, depressed, okay? And I hope I don't have to convince you very hard that the yellow blobs are different across all of those measures. So we seem to be able to pick up a signal for depression just using people's geolocation. And you can feed that into a classifier, so where you present uh, the, the different features and look at how accurate they are at identifying who's depressed or not. And we can do that with about 85% accuracy. It's pretty good. But you might say, well, most people can tell you when they're depressed, so why do you need to measure it? And I think that's, of course, a very reasonable thing to say. And, of course, this is done on a group level. So are, is this true of all individuals? Or, um, you know, there may be different patterns in different people. So I'm just going to show you very quickly what we've been doing here. This is one person as an example. These are these different metrics of your geolocation, homestay, diurnal variation, location variance, that sort of thing. Here's your mood. So visualising this, I, that kind of looks... Like, it might be a bit of a pattern, doesn't it? They've got a bit more depressed and some of these things have come down a bit. But it's quite messy data, so we tend to apply a filter. And we've chosen a filter that only that means that you can only use data you already know about, so you don't use data from the future, all right? Because if you use a window, if you're looking at point X, you're using um, information that has come after that point. Okay, does that make sense? So, and you can't look into the future. So that's false in terms of the use, utility of this in a clinical situation. I can see people frowning. So if I was looking at this point here, let's go back one actually, that's the easiest way of doing it. If I was looking at this point here and we filter it, we apply a window, okay, 
At this point here, you'll take information from in front and before. Okay, but in reality, you never know what the in front, the, the, the future holds. So you can, we've limited it to only using the data that's come before that point. Okay. So if we say offline, which is where we take these features and we say, can we predict their depression score? So you remove one point and you use your other data to predict that point. Okay. We can predict, this is the red line, very nicely, someone's depression score. But again, we fall into that same problem. We, can't, we don't know the future. Okay, so we can do that offline, that's lovely with a nice data set like we've got, but if you wanted to use this in reality, you're going to have to do it online. And what's really interesting is we can do it online, I was really surprised by this, so we're rubbish to begin with, that's not a surprise, we haven't got enough data. But actually as we get to know this individual, we can start to do pretty well at predicting what their score will be next week. Just simply from where they've been or where their mobile phone has been actually, because of course we can't necessarily know that it's them using their phone, but we, most people do carry them with them. And that's without having to ask them anything. And I think this is really exciting, because if you started to notice these changes, you could ping a message to someone, couldn't you? Just say, things are right. Get them to fill in a mood rating. So you could be much more sensitive about when you asked people and how you understood their patterns of behaviour. And you could start to learn, um, or the patient could start to learn about how their patterns evolved. Just to say, we have done this for almost all our individual people now, OK? And we can do it pretty well for most I at an individual level. We're not using the same metrics for each person, so people will have a, you know, we learn about which metrics work best for them um, because they will be different from different individuals. So, I think that was all I was going to say, but really just to emphasise, obviously, smartphones are widely available. The fact that we now have mobile phone coverage pretty much everywhere means that you can submit data very easily. I think wearables do offer alternative data streams. We've done a lot of work with Fitbits and Actigraphy, which I'm happy to talk about if people are interested. It's quite an efficient way of collecting data and delivering it, actually, as well. From our perspective, it's really enhanced our understanding of psychiatric phenotypes, so what these things are like. It can enhance practice because it can make us better at our diagnoses, better at measuring treatment response in a much more nuanced way, and, of course, general well-being. I think, really importantly, it seems to enhance people's understanding of their own patterns um, in a much more powerful way than delivering a psychoeducation tool appears to be. Um, it's highlighted new um, treatment targets, and I think these sort of within participant analyses that like I've just shown you for those individuals are likely to be the most powerful going forward that you learn about the individual rather than just the group effects. So I should acknowledge these sorts of studies involve huge numbers of people, um, and it's been mostly funded by the Wellcome Trust. Um, but we're very grateful to the IBME and clever mathematicians because some of the clever maths is well beyond me. Uh, so I do just need to really acknowledge uh, their input. And of course, our participants who've been fantastic and very motivated actually to get interested and involved um, in it all. Great, thank you.